Thank you for your attention. I know it's been a long day, but I think this will be, this will be a good one. <laughs> so cancer. Cancer needs no introduction. There probably isn't a single person in this room who hasn't had family or friends whose lives have been touched by cancer. How many of you have had family or friends whose lives have been touched by cancer? Yeah, I've, I've lost relatives. I've lost uh, an aunt, my grandmother, to cancer. Uh, my youngest sister, she, she had cancer when she was a teenager. She survived, she's okay. But yeah, unfortunately, cancer is a part of, I guess I can say, all of our lives. So I'm a chemistry professor at UH Manoa. My research is on the atomic structure of proteins, the biochemistry of cancer-related proteins. So what are proteins? So proteins make up the mechanical parts of cells. You can think of cells like people. Cells need to eat food, they metabolize the food, they expel waste, they grow, and they reproduce. All of these different functions in cells are carried out by different proteins. So why, why does anyone care about what I research, the structure of proteins? Well, let me tell you a little bit about myself and my background and why I'm here today. Um, as mentioned during the introduction, I'm from here. I grew up in Honolulu. Uh, I've always been interested in science as far back as I can remember. Like a lot of kids, I was interested in bugs, rocks, stars, trees, and I followed up on that interest my whole life. I was fortunate enough to do well in school and had good teachers. And after graduating from high school, I went on to Harvard to study biochemistry. At Harvard was where I developed my interest in protein structure. I was drawn to this field because of its interdisciplinary nature. There was a lot of opportunities to challenge myself intellectually and creatively in trying to understand biology and medicine at the level of chemistry and physics. After Harvard, I moved on to UCLA into the combined MD-PhD program. I wanted to apply science to solving real life biomedical problems. I completed two years of medical school at UCLA and then I decided to focus on research as my career. Research is what I, was what I enjoyed most and that was also where I felt I could make the greatest difference. I was fortunate enough to publish a few research papers while I was UCLA, and I was pretty, I was excited about it, uh, going on, moving on to a promising research career. But my life took a sharp twist at that point. During those last few months at UCLA, I was working like crazy. I was completing my research in the lab, I was trying to write up some papers for publication, finishing up my dissertation, and I just found myself exhausted all the time. But that wasn't new to me. I had always worked hard my whole life. But this time it was a little different. There's a, UCLA is situated on a hill, so I would walk up this hill every day to go to, to, go to campus, but I found myself very easily winded. And I just thought, oh, you're just working too hard, you need, you're, you're just out of shape, you, you don't work out anymore. Um, and it just kept pushing myself harder. You know, I, 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 I was really hard on myself. You know, no, no excuses, no pain, uh, no pain, no gain. But, after, but very shortly, my body started to tell me things I couldn't ignore. I started breaking, the, breaking down in bruises all over my body for no reason. I developed spots in my eyes. Uh, I was only 20 something years old and I came down with pneumonia several times. So I was, something was wrong. I wanted to see a doctor, but at that time I had just moved to a new position at UC Berkeley 
and I had to wait quite a while for the medical insurance to kick in. But by the, to by the time I was uh, finally able to get the insurance going, I was in really bad shape. I couldn't, I couldn't walk half a block without having to stop and gasp for air. My body was literally falling apart by the day. So I finally did get to see a doctor. He left me a voicemail saying, you have to go to the emergency room right away. Your white blood cell count is 350,000. I called a high school classmate friend who's a doctor and asked him what that meant. He asked me, 350,000? Are you sure he didn't mean 3,500? My white blood cell count was 100 times higher than normal. So in the emergency room, I was diagnosed with this very long, uh, with this disease with a very long name, CML, chronic myelogenous leukemia. Uh, a leukemia is a cancer of white blood cells. Myolo myelogenous refers to a certain kind of white blood cell. There are many different kinds of white blood cells. And chronic refers to a slow developing cancer. CML is a rare cancer that affects about a one in 100,000. It's, slow, it's slowly developing, so it usually takes about five years or so to kill a patient. So, I was in the hospital for a, a week, and as you can, to, for my health to stabilize, and as you can imagine, this was a terrifying time for me. I was just 29 years old. I wasn't ready for this. But I was very unlucky to develop, to get diagnosed with this one in 100,000 cancer. But on the other hand, I was extraordinarily lucky to come down with CML in the year 2001 and not earlier. If I had been diagnosed just five years earlier, there's a good chance I wouldn't be here talking with you today. In 2001, a revolutionary new CML drug called Gleevec was approved by the FDA. Prior to Gleevec, the treatment for CML was a bone marrow transplant. And a bone marrow transplant, in my case, I had about a 30% chance of dying from the transplant procedure itself. And the transplants, they don't always work in curing CML. But instead, all I had to do was pop a few pills every day. Not bad. As we can see, prior to Gleevec, the, the five-year survival rates for CML we're only about 39%. If you go longer than five years, it looks pretty bad. But after CML, after the development, after uh, Gleevec was arri arrived, this shot up to an amazing 90%, just like that. And on top of that, Gleevec, unlike traditional chemotherapy, has relatively few toxic side effects. All in all, I missed maybe three weeks of work, and after that, I was able to continue working full-time for, for many years, and I lived a pretty normal life. Not bad for a disease that was often considered a terminal diagnosis. So what is the secret behind Gleevec? To understand how Gleevec works, I'm going to, uh, you have to understand how cancer and how CML works. So cancer is essentially uncontrolled growth of cells. Now CML is a very special cancer. It is the only cancer that scientists understand the single molecular defect that is responsible. In this case, it's in a protein called ABL. ABL normally controls cell growth in cells. You can think of ABL 
like an accelerator pedal on a car. In the case of CML, the ABO is defective. And what you get is you get, a, you get the equivalent of an accelerator pedal that's just jammed. And you get a car, a cell, that's just out of control. And it just grows like crazy. And that's why I had my 100 times higher than normal white blood cell count. What Gleevec does is that it binds this ABO protein and, dis and just disables it, shuts off the gas pedal. Without, the, without this crazy ABO, the leukemic cells die. But healthy cells that don't have this bad ABO are not affected by Gleevec. And so that's how it's different. Traditional chemotherapy typically kills both healthy cells and cancer cells. But Gleevec is a targeted drug. Now, back, going back to protein structure. Excuse me. Knowledge of the protein structure, the, the atomic structure of the ABO protein played a very important part in understanding how Gleevec works. And coincidentally, the, the atomic structure of ABO was discovered by a professor in my department at UC Berkeley. Let me tell you, being a cancer patient really teaches you to appreciate the impact of good research. So while being a patient and simultaneously being in the proximity of leading researchers, that really sharpened my focus of my research to focusing on the structure of cancer-related proteins, which is what I do now. OK, enough about myself. Back to the protein structure. So. Some of, some of my, uh, so right now I'm teaching chemistry at, UC, at UH Manoa. And sometimes I get students that complain to me about, about how, oh, I don't like chemistry, it's so abstract. And, and uh, you know, it, it, the atoms and molecules, it's just so abstract. You can't really touch them and see them. But you can, you can see them. That's what I do in my research. So what, does it, so what does it mean to be able to see molecules? So here, well, let's start with this. Let's imagine we're looking down through this microscope. Now here, we're looking at a, what I would consider a low resolution magnification, 500 times magnification of uh, a smear of blood cells. So this is what you would see if you were to get a get a blood draw at the, at the doctor's office. And here you can see white blood cells and red blood cells. As we continue to zoom in, you can see a lot of structural features, a lot of bumps on the surface of each of the cells. And as we continue to zoom in, all of those bumps resolve into clusters of proteins. So now we're at a million times magnification. And if we just zoom in a little bit more, 10 million times magnification this is the level that I work on, atomic level. So here we're looking at the structure of that ABO protein that I mentioned earlier. Each of these bumps in this figure is one atom. And in red is that, Gle is, is that Gleevec molecule. The Gleevec molecule here, you can see how it has penetrated the ABO protein and basically just jammed it up. So through using x-rays and computer modeling, we can create these three-dimensional, we can create these three-dimensional images. And using these three-dimensional data, chemists can, chemists can model different chem, uh, design, uh, uh, compounds into the target. Again, this is ABLE to look for 
to see which one gets the best fit. So a good drug would be one that fits into the unique crevices of a protein, but, not into, but does not interact with another protein, thereby causing fewer toxic side effects. And in this way, a newer drug was developed, a super Gleevec, that was even more potent with even fewer side effects, called Tosigna. And, and this is what I take now, just a few of these a day. And I have almost, the only side effect I have from this is uh, occasional acne. <laughs> Pretty good, huh? I, <laughs> yeah, people use, a lot of people used to die from this. So I've, I've been very lucky. I benefited from a miracle drug. So I feel like I've been given a second chance in life. So what I want to do is I want to be able to share this miracle with other cancer patients. So the current, one of my current goals of my research is working on a new target. In this case, the estrogen receptor protein. This is a new estrogen receptor that has been recently discovered and is believed to drive breast cancer and ovarian cancer. And right now, this picture is from a computer-generated model. If we can, my, but the computer-generated model is basically an educated guess. It's not accurate enough, accurate enough to do that kind of rational drug design work. So my goal is to do, it, to do an experimental image of this receptor for drug design. Over the years, we have made a lot of progress with breast cancer. Not, uh, state, not rapid um, progress like with CML, but gradual progress. And, you, uh, but you have to remember that CML is a rare cancer, but breast cancer is a cancer that will affect 12% of all US women. So every few percentage points that we can increase survival means, a means thousands of lives saved. So things are looking good, but there are still major challenges ahead, and a lot of them are not scientific. These drugs are really expensive. Gleevec is $35,000 a year. Perceptin, a breast cancer drug, $50,000 a year. And Tosigna, this little guy, $75,000 a year. This is beyond most of us, including myself, can afford, not to mention people who, uh, people who live in developing countries. So I don't have an answer for this, but I'm hoping that some of you smart business or policy people out there can think, uh, become aware of this issue and can propose some solutions. And I feel like if we can address these socioeconomic issues, and that's a big if, I feel very bright, I feel very confident that we'll be making a lot of progress fighting cancer over the next few decades. I think over the next few decades, we'll be able to control or cure most major cancers. We are entering a golden age of medicine. And the, the speed of progress in science is unprecedented and accelerating. I want to encourage the young people out there, the students, to, re to consider a career in medicine or in science. This is an exhilarating time to be a researcher or to be a doctor. And you'll have, you'll have amazing opportunities to make a difference. Your patients, and like it or not, we are all patients, will be very grateful. Thank you. <laughs>